At last, at last, a voice for people who pay big government bills, not those who make big government bills. You are listening to Speaking of Taxpayers here on Gimme Radio, sponsored by the 362,000 member National Taxpayers Union. I'm your co-host Pete Sepp. And I'm Natasha Altamirano. Today we're going to be talking about a, an annual report issued by the trustees of Medicare um, Pete, can you tell us a little bit more about what this year's report said? Every year, at least in recent years, the trustees of Social Security and Medicare, who are supposed to be an independent advisory board concerning the status of this program, issue a report of the so-called assets in the Medicare Part A trust fund, how the Part B supplemental insurance funding is going, how the new prescription drug benefit is playing out in terms of outlays versus premiums they're getting. And the news is really bad. In fact, if you've been scared about the impending bankruptcy of Medicare in the past, you're going to be even more frightened now because economic conditions have affected, in turn, the condition of Medicare itself. What does this year's Medicare report show? Well, the trustees are saying that Medicare's hospital insurance fund, that is the Part A portion of the program that takes care of people who have acute needs and wind up in the hospital or some other kind of institution, they're saying that the Part A trust fund will be exhausted by the year 2017, two years earlier than was predicted in the last report. Number one, the problem is that payroll tax receipts are not as high. Fewer people are working now. More people are unemployed. And so you're getting less payroll tax receipts. But the outlays of the program are also a problem with the aging of America, with the increase of acute conditions and hospitalizations. Expenses are going to go up. Meanwhile, very little is being done to curb the waste, fraud, and abuse in the program. You combine those three factors and you have a bankruptcy problem that is almost always looming for this program and is now looming two years closer than they originally predicted. And I understand the Social Security Trust Fund also is predicted to run out of funds sooner than previously forecast. Is that correct? Oh, yes, indeed. The Social Security Trust Fund has a problem, too, and the assets in that fund will run out in the year 2037. A lot of people are thinking that's still a long way off. Well, 29, 30 years, I suppose, is a period of time that people would be saying, well, what's the worry? The worry is that bankruptcy date has been pushed four years sooner than previously forecast. Again, some of the same conditions afflicting Medicare's cost increases and its looming bankruptcy date are now impacting Social Security. The bottom line is these two programs, according to the actuaries and the trustees of Social Security and Medicare, could account for more than 17% of our gross domestic product by the year 2083. Again, a long way off, but this is going to be a very rapid curve in expense increases for these two programs. And when people say, well, what's 17% of gross domestic product? What does that mean? How bad is it? Well, right now, the historical average for all federal expenditures as a percentage of gross domestic product is between 19 and 20 percent. This year, it's much more because of the stimulus program and the bailouts, but normally it's in the 19 to 20 percent range for the entire federal government. Compare that to the 17 percent prediction for just Social Security and Medicare if nothing is done to curb their costs. That basically means virtually all federal government expenditures will be on these two programs if we intend to keep the federal government share of the economy consistent with historical norms. If we don't, we're looking at a socialist economy. 
And this isn't the first year that Medicare's trustees have sounded the alarm, is it, Pete? No, this is actually the fourth year in a row that the trustees of Medicare have said there are serious short-term financing problems with the program. Under the Medicare Prescription Drug Act of 2003, not a great law in the first place, one we opposed, there was at least one redeeming feature which required trustees to sound the alarm whenever Medicare's financial condition was becoming so bad that general revenues would have to be increased dramatically to keep meeting the obligations of the program. Originally, the law said not only did the trustees have to issue this funding warning, but the President and Congress had to take certain actions to, number one, come up with a plan to address the shortfall, and number two, at least consider the plan. Well, those two requirements were ditched last year. So basically, these guys are crying in the wilderness, and Congress and the president can just shut their ears to it. What about some of the other parts of Medicare? Well, there's also Medicare Part B, Supplementary Medical Insurance. That's the kind of services that retirees get for normal doctor visits or inpatient clinics and the like. Now, that is adequately financed, according to Medicare's trustees, because it's partially funded by premiums that retirees pay. Those generally go up with program expenses, but it's also funded in part by general revenues from the Treasury. Here's the problem, though, and the retirees say this, and I quote, However, further congressional overrides of scheduled fee reductions together with an existing hold harmless provision restricting premium increases for most beneficiaries could jeopardize Part B solvency. In other words, if the program were allowed to adjust costs on its own, the short-term outlook at least is fairly decent for Part B, but Congress keeps short-circuiting that system, saying, okay, for this year, no, we're not going to increase the premiums. No, we're not going to control the costs. We're just going to let the system keep going and going. These congressional actions are imperiling even Part B of Medicare. So that's another problem we have to worry about. So what can we do to resolve it if Congress and the president, you know, are not going to seem to listen to this warning this year? Well, I think we need to recognize that many of the solutions the trustees are proposing would have to be immediate ones. In other words, for Social Security, for example, the trustees are saying we could keep the system reasonably solvent in the long term if we raise workers' Social Security payroll taxes by two percentage points. Well, that sounds like a very minuscule increase, two percent, but again, Listen to what we're saying here, folks. Two percentage points in a rate that is already 12.4%. That actually represents a much larger increase in the amount of payroll taxes that workers and employers would be liable for. And this change would have to be implemented right now, virtually next month, in order to keep the system solvent. If Congress would delay in raising the tax by two or three years, we'd be looking at a much bigger increase. We don't want those kinds of tax increases now or in the future, but I think it illustrates just how urgent the problem is. Every year we delay makes it exponentially more difficult to balance these things out. And of course, with Medicare, whose problems are occurring much sooner than Social Security's, the actions would have to be even more drastic. In order to rescue Medicare, at least the Part A portion from bankruptcy, the current payroll tax, which funds hospital insurance of 2.90%, would have to be immediately increased to 6.8% just to cover this actuarial deficit. You combine that with the immediate change that would be necessary in Social Security, and you're talking about an increase in the amount of payroll taxes that individuals and employers would be liable for of 75%. You'd be paying 75% more right now, right here, to keep those systems solvent. The fact that Congress and the President won't do that 
only means that amount as a percentage will keep going up and up. A very bleak picture, and one that the White House and Congress need to start confronting. Well, a lot of disturbing news in that last segment. Is there any good news? Is there any attempt by Congress or the administration to come up with spending reductions rather than tax increases to address this looming entitlement problem? Well, good news and bad news, really. I quote David Axelrod, a senior White House advisor, saying in, in reaction to this trustees report, the president is committed to a serious effort to confront that issue. Uh, I expect that as the year goes on, that will become a prominent discussion with leaders and members of Congress. That's what the words of David Axelrod. I don't necessarily see a deep promise to enact the kind of dramatic systemic spending cuts we will need in order to keep Medicare and Social Security solvent, nor do I see a very uh, strong of a commitment to reform those programs themselves to help individuals rely more on private savings and doctor-patient relationships and uh, consumer relationships to keep Medicare and Social Security costs down. It sounds like some of the same boilerplate that was going on in the Bush administration, and that does not bode well. But, Natasha, you did find a silver lining, a very, very thin one, to these clouds. Is that right? Well, yes, Pete. President Obama recently proposed about $17 billion in cuts from various federal agencies and programs, but that is not really going to be enough to sustain the growth in Social Security or Medicare, is it, Pete? No, and part of the problem there, too, is that members of Obama's own party are saying that many of these cuts are non-starters. Look at some of the agriculture policy reductions that Obama is making. He wants to get rid of or scale back the so-called market access program. That's a program that basically pays wealthy food companies to advertise their products overseas. Used to be called the market promotion program, but because it had become so scandalized doing things like advertising for California raisins in Japan and scaring kids to death because they thought the raisins were disembodied thumbs, <laughs> the program's name had to be changed. It's still the same program, still the same waste of money, but with a different name. But chief members of the agricultural committees in Congress, Democrats, mind you, are saying, forget it. He's not going to get these reductions in these programs. He's not going to get the limitations he wants on farm subsidy payments. He should move on. This is a phenomenon that was going on in the Bush administration, too, even when Republicans controlled Congress. The White House would propose a number of program terminations or reductions, and members of their own party in the legislative branch would fight administration officials on it. So I would say that unless President Obama draws a line in the sand now on spending reductions and insists on getting his way, he's going to have the same kind of problems that Bush had with his own party, and he's going to lose all credibility, even on the small amount of spending reductions he's proposed here. By the way, folks, if you want to measure this, $17 billion sounds like a whole lot of money, but when you compare it to the $3 trillion plus that we are spending this year, it's less than a fraction of a percentage point. That shows you the very difficult mountain we have to surmount here in terms of bringing the federal budget back under control. And it sounds like $17 billion in cuts is really not going to happen from what you're saying. It'll end up being much less, if anything, if any of the cuts he's proposed will actually pass. Unless the Obama administration is willing to put some capital political capital on the line, I'm afraid that will be the outcome. We should also bear in mind that some of the things that the Obama administration is characterizing as savings are really just tax increases in disguise, repealing some of the provisions that uh, oil companies, for example, use, just like any other company, to deduct uh, costs of domestic production. The administration is saying, well, we're going to keep this domestic production credit 
for all companies except oil. Very discriminatory treatment. That's characterized as a savings. I don't know why. So again, we have a big challenge here, and um, the administration really has to step up to the plate or risk being totally marginalized in this debate. And speaking of bloated federal spending, we come to that great $787 billion pie in the sky, the stimulus package, and with it, one item in it that is the outrage of the week. Could this be the next bridge to nowhere? By that term, I'm referring to the bridge up in Alaska that Ted Stevens was able to secure that uh, linked essentially two underpopulated areas and would hardly be used, yet would cost hundreds of millions of dollars in federal and state funds to complete. It became the laughing stock, the poster child. Pick any analogy you want, but it became the biggest and worst example of congressional pork barreling and earmarking. Now we may have one in Florida in the form of the Indian Street Bridge across the St. Lucie River, a $128 million bridge, and it's getting federal stimulus funds. Tell us a little more about this, Natasha. That's right, Pete. The Indian Street Bridge across the St. Lucie River in Florida stands to receive some of the state's 12 or $13 billion in federal stimulus funds. Critics of the plan, including at least one public official, are questioning whether it's needed because it connects the communities of Palm City and Stewart, but there is already a bridge that connects the two communities less than three miles away. Yes, and some of the folks are saying that even with the existing bridges, there's no problem with traffic. If you have to go out of your way a couple miles, you're getting to a bridge that people apparently can do 50 or 55 miles per hour all the time. Uh, there are those who say, well, this will create jobs, about 3,500 of them. Again, as we've said in the past, uh, in economic theory, that is not necessarily an added value to the economy. For every job that's being created with federal funding here, other employment opportunities are being lost because this money is coming from taxpayers, not only current taxpayers, but future ones in the form of borrowing. As I will remind Gimme Radio listeners, the Congressional Budget Office concluded that because the stimulus package represents borrowed money, because that will crowd out future credit in the private sector, the net effect on jobs could be zero or worse if we look at the long-term picture. But even over the short term, we have a problem. Much of this stimulus money was advertised as going to projects that were shovel-ready. In other words, something that could be built right away, get people to work right away. Well, the problem with this bridge is it's not shovel-ready. It can't be completed in three years because all of the land necessary to build the bridge on has yet to be acquired. The Florida Department of Transportation says it has purchased just 33 of the 63 pieces of property it will need to complete the bridge. And they won't be able to acquire them all until early 2011. I certainly wouldn't call that shovel-ready. I don't think most taxpayers would. So, do you think this might be the next bridge to nowhere? Or just a bridge that wastes a lot of money, even if it's going somewhere? I think that you have to make up your own mind, but most of you will probably conclude that, once again, Washington tax dollars taken from our pockets is being wasted. Closing out this edition of Speaking of Taxpayers on Gimme Radio, we'd like to remind all listeners that the National Taxpayers Conference is taking place here in the Washington, D.C. area, June 11th through 13th. It is chock full of training sessions for would-be citizen activists, policy briefings on the most important issues affecting taxpayers, even notable keynote speakers, people like John McCain, U.S. Senator, and former presidential candidate and well-known pork buster. He has just agreed to speak at National Taxpayers Conference on the issues that we've been speaking about on this program. How will we address entitlements? How will we get rid of pork barrel spending? How will we prioritize federal programs? And joining him in those questions and answering them will be a whole host of other speakers, such as 
former Comptroller General of the U.S., David Walker. So what you've got is a power-packed, star-studded lineup you cannot afford to miss. And to help you afford these great speakers, these great sessions, we have extended the $99 early bird conference rate to Gimme Radio listeners. But if they want to get that rate, they've got to hurry. They have to do it online. Is that not correct, Natasha? That's right. Visit our website, www.ntu.org, to register today. You won't miss it. There's a button on our homepage. You'll get hotel information, speaker information, more details about the agenda, and you'll be able to register right there online, ntu.org. That just about wraps up this week's edition of Speaking of Taxpayers. Thank you for joining us. I'm Natasha Altamirano. And I'm Pete Sepp. Remember, you have the power to fight the power if you speak truth to power. And we speak truth to power every week here on Speaking of Taxpayers.